the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. A crackdown on the ultra-Orthodox in Israel leads to multiple arrests. The Jewish films you'll be hearing about in 2012, Donna Karen's take on Judaism, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. At least six ultra-Orthodox leaders have been arrested in Israel in what's being described as a crackdown on ultra-Orthodox extremism. The six men arrested over the weekend are all leaders in the ultra-Orthodox organization Ada Haredis. Officials have said that more arrests are coming. The arrests are on charges of a variety of financial crimes, but the timing of the arrests is being viewed as a response to revelations of ultra-Orthodox gender segregation and violence in recent weeks and months. This is the first major act by the administration of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to find ways to curb the violent and anti-woman activities among the ultra-Orthodox. The charges being leveled against the six men include money laundering, tax fraud, and embezzlement through various Orthodox-controlled nonprofit organizations. Part of the evidence for this is scheduled donations of fixed amounts regularly made to and donations received from a variety of organizations in Israel and other countries. The allegations call to mind the money laundering among a number of Orthodox rabbis in the United States that was revealed in 2009, in which multiple rabbis pleaded guilty to having shuffled money among nonprofits for a fee in order to help others avoid paying taxes owed on their income. Money laundering among certain ultra-Orthodox groups is something of an open secret, and the Netanyahu administration's choice to prosecute these crimes now suggests they're willing to use a variety of indirect tools to curb growing ultra-Orthodox influence and demands. Of course, these enforcement activities were not taken lightly among the ultra-Orthodox who'd been perpetrating violence already. Hundreds rioted in response to the arrests, throwing stones at police, setting trash cans on fire, and blocking off roads. Police arrested several of those rioting. More violence could be coming, including here in the United States, as one of the Grand Rebbe's of the Satmar Hasidic community has called for adherents to, quote, rock and shake the world in response to the arrests, including at Israeli consulates in America. Meanwhile, the other far right in Israel also stands accused of violence. A mosque was vandalized and three cars were burned in the West Bank village of Deir Estia in response to the Netanyahu government's raising of an illegal outpost the day before. Jewish vandalism is also being cited here in the United States in two cases that originally looked like anti-Semitic attacks. The first case is that of the torching of three cars in Midwood, Brooklyn last November. Police now think that the crime was an insurance scam, according to the New York Daily News. The second case was also in Midwood, Brooklyn. A number of swastikas were painted on apartment doors, and anti-Semitic graffiti was also placed around the neighborhood, in addition to anti-Semitic phone calls threatening violence. Police now think they have the man who did all of those things in custody. 56-year-old David Haddad is Jewish, and many of his alleged victims are family members with whom he is reportedly in a business dispute. Haddad has been charged with aggravated harassment as a hate crime. But a series of attacks in northern New Jersey is still considered to be composed of authentically anti-Semitic crimes. In recent months, Jewish shopping areas, homes, and synagogues have been vandalized in various neighborhoods there. Now a rabbi's home attached to a synagogue has been firebombed. The rabbi, his wife, and their five children were unharmed. The synagogue is Congregation Beth El of Rutherford, New Jersey, and the attack is being described by the Associated Press as, quote, the latest in a series of incidents targeting synagogues in Bergen County. Of course, when one's talking about anti-Semitic violence, the most prominent example given is often that of the Holocaust. One notorious concentration camp was held up by the Nazis as an example of how well Jews were being treated to Reisenstadt, where a false front of culture and concerts hid the Nazis' torture and murder. But an effort is underway to show that the Jewish culture there is nonetheless real, as Christian Neiden reports. The 92nd Street Y played host to a unique singing and chamber music performance this week, featuring music composed by Jews interned by the Nazis during World War II at the Terezin camp and ghetto in Bohemia. As baritone Wolfgang Holtzmeier sang and the Nash Ensemble chamber group played, the source of the music added a mournful reality to the beautiful notes echoing through 92 Wise Kaufman Concert Hall. <laughs> The 
the delicately enunciated German lyrics sung by Holtzmeier during his performance were in tribute to the grim fate of their writers. Among them was Ilse Weber, who before dying at Auschwitz was in charge of the children's infirmary at Terezin, where she wrote several songs, including I Wander Through Theresienstadt, mourning her captivity. To hear more about the music of Terrazin, please tune into the full broadcast edition of the Week in Review. Thank you, Christian. Moving on to Jewish culture of the current day, many Jews are continuing to have an impact on the world of fashion, few more prominently than Donna Karen. Meredith Gansman spoke with her last week. Few designers are as essential and signature in the world of fashion as Donna Karen. And before her fall 2012 collection hits the runway, I got to sit down with one of the biggest Jewish names in the industry. But just how did a nice Jewish girl from Long Island become a fashion icon? That was the central question put to Donna Karen at Manhattan's 92nd Street Y for the fashion icons with Fern Malice series. I think it would be past, present, and future. Uh, a glimpse at my life. It's kind of wonderful about me being able to, you know, really reflect upon my life and how I started uh, working for Anne Klein, then to Donna Karen, DKNY. Fashion industry leader Fern Malice defined Karen as... As the quintessential American modern designer who really gets women and she is us. She is, she's every woman. But Karen sees herself more as a sculptor than a designer. When I think about fashion design, yeah, because I sculpt the body. I think more is when I, you know, work on fabric and, and in sculpting the body and, and clothes. But I would say myself more as an artist is dressing people on their inside and on the outside, you know, and in their life. To see what's in store for Donna Karen at Fall 2012 Fashion Week, tune into the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Finally, on Jewish culture, Jewish filmmaking is obviously one major endeavor, and January's New York Jewish Film Festival is a good preview of what's to come in Jewish film for the year. Rebecca Honig Friedman stopped by. While Hollywood is buzzing about the Oscars and the Golden Globes, New York is revving up for the 21st New York Jewish Film Festival. And I'm here at the Walter Reed Theater at Lincoln Center to get you the scoop about this year's films. Running through January 26th, the festival is screening a diverse group of 25 feature-length movies and documentaries, as well as eight short films, from around the world. And opening day kicked off with two films demonstrating the breadth of this collection. The award-winning Israeli fictional film Mabul, or The Storm, about a young boy whose autistic older brother comes home after many years in an institution, and the ambitious documentary 400 Miles to Freedom, a multi-layered exploration of Jewish identity, race, and the Ethiopian Jewish experience, told through the dramatic personal story of the filmmaker, who as a boy was kidnapped by slave traffickers in the Sudan on his family's journey from Ethiopia to Israel. Where 400 Miles to Freedom tells a true story that plays out almost like a fiction, Mabul is a fiction with acting that feels real. Actor Mikhail Moshinov, who plays Tomer, the autistic older brother, and who you may recognize from the film Tehillim, which has been airing here on the Jewish Channel, was on hand for a Q&A after the screening. Moshinov is the child of prominent Israeli actors, and he said he learned from them to take his job very seriously, especially with a role like this one. When you play in a character that you have to study from the inside and you have to learn everything about it and you have to really do a long research in that way you feel like um, it's not just an act you have to understand that you have a responsibility to tell the story of this character for more on these and other films now playing at the 21st new york jewish film festival tune in to the full broadcast version of the week in review Thank you, Rebecca. That's all for this week. From all of us here at the Jewish Channel, be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 291, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and now on Comcast Cable in the on-demand menu under Premium Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.